Good afternoon. In December of 2016, a large group gathered at the Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital in the company of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and noted philanthropist Larry Tannenbaum to announce the establishment of the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute, whose aim was to encourage the world's scientific community to consider a new approach to research and discovery, a model where scientists would embrace greater collaboration and be forthright in sharing their findings without patents in the interest of advancing our collective understanding of disease and illness. Nobody could have imagined how quickly the world's scientists would rally behind this open approach. All it took was a global pandemic. Today, as the world scientists are mobilized in the fight against COVID-19, traditional borders across countries and between academia and private industry are no longer an impediment to progress. How is this new spirit of scientific collaboration helping advance the research work around COVID-19? Will it get us to a vaccine or therapies any quicker? And will this pandemic mark a true turning point in the bid to reimagine how science is done forevermore? Welcome to this week's McGill Alumni webcast, How COVID-19 is Changing How the World Does Science. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement, and it's Thursday, May 7th. Today, I'm joined by three McGill experts from the fields of medicine and law who are here to unpack some of the seismic shifts taking place in scientific research and to help us understand whether we are, in fact, about to enter a new era of increased collaboration. Let me quickly introduce them. First, we have Dr. Vincent Mosier, who's a full professor in McGill's Faculty of Medicine, the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Genomic Medicine, and a former Vice President of Applied Genetics at Glasgow Smith Klein. He is also leading the task force, task force to establish the Quebec COVID-19 Biobank, a province-wide initiative to collect, store, and share samples of, and data related to the COVID-19 crisis. We also have with us Dr. Jason Karam Chandani, who is an associate professor in McGill's Department of Pathology, a neuropathologist at the Montreal Neurological Institute, and director of the Neuros Biobank. And finally, Professor Richard Gold, James McGill Professor in the Faculty of Law, an associate member of the McGill Department of Human Genetics and the Biomedical Ethics Unit, and a well-known and widely published author on the philosophy and practice of open science. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you for taking time out of your days to join us for this discussion. Let me begin with Dr. Karam Chandani, who I believe was in the audience that frigid December day back in 2016, when the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute was first announced. Can you tell us exactly what is stored in a biobank, and how has the concept of open science changed the way scientists use those samples and materials? That's a great question, Derek. Thank you. I believe Richard and I were both there on that uh, chilly December morning in the company of the prime minister when the neuro was lucky enough to receive this transformative gift from Larry Tannenbaum, allowing for the creation of the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute. One of the main platforms of the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute was the creation of an open science biorepository centered here at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Now you asked about what does a biobank do and what does it collect? And the answer is it depends entirely on the scientific mandate of the collection. Here at the Montreal Neurological Institute, we focus on neurological diseases. So we created the CBIG Open Science Biorepository. CBIG is actually an acronym standing for Clinical Information, Imaging, Biospecimen, and Genetics and we collect data from patients with neurological diseases as well as healthy controls. The neuro entered into the uh, paradigm of open science with eyes wide open, and we didn't make this decision lightly. Under the directorship of our leader, Dr. Guy Rouleau, there was an 18-month stakeholder consultation to establish the principles in which this institute would embark on a journey towards open science. One of those principles is the open sharing of data and materials with collaborators and in industry, both inside the Institute and outside of the Institute. So I think one of the key differences of the CBIG repository is that we are not just here to serve investigators in the Montreal Neurological Institute, but collaborators in the province, across the country and around the world. Great, well, thank you for that uh, incredible introduction. I do want to, uh, revisit some of the aspects behind that open science philosophy and what it really means. And we'll definitely, uh, I think, have time to get to a lot of that during this this next uh, uh, hour or so that we have together. Let me turn right now to Dr. Mosier. Uh, speaking of biobanks, uh, so you have been tasked with building um, Quebec's COVID-19 biobank. So can you tell us a little bit about how this is being set up 
and what role it might play in helping us better understand this virus and future infectious diseases that might attack us. Uh, just if you can just unmute yourself <laughs> first. Thanks there for you giving me the chance to, to describe to you this biobank. It's a mandate that we have received from the Fonds de Recherche du Québec en Santé and from Genome Québec to make sure that scientists and researchers who are trying to better understand this infection have access to high quality data and samples from COVID infected patients and controls. Because research is absolutely needed. There is no way we will get out of these COVID pandemics without research, but research is not possible without data and samples. And that's the mandate we have received, making sure that we have these data and samples properly collected and consented as well. So we need to provide information to patients and inform them that their data and samples will be used for high quality research. Now, okay. that's the mandate we have received from FRQS. And to essentially realize this mandate, we have assembled a task force originally of eight people, including four people from McGill, each of them with a very specific expertise and task. And uh, the strategy we have decided to use is to collect initially samples and data plus consent from severely ill people who are affected by the disease and require hospitalization. Now, what is really new here is firstly, it's a province-wide initiative. So I think it's fair to say that we achieved here, and uh, what I'm saying we is really this task force, uh, have achieved in a matter of three or four weeks, would have taken before COVID months or maybe years, or maybe never. <laughs> we could get the same SOP, standard operating procedures, the same study design, the same questionnaire, uh, the same ethics approval from all the institutions in the province. And we have actually made it happen. We are recruiting, we are collecting consent data and samples. By yesterday, we had 494 patients who had been recruited, which is already one of the largest biobank on severely ill COVID patients. But I'd like also to make another point. The consent allows to make data and samples widely available for researchers. And here I must really express my gratitude to the new role, to Jason and to the team there because they have paved the way in data sharing. And we are, they are inspiring models for us for this COVID initiative, but also for another initiative that uh, we are running with Dr. Brent Richards, which is called the McGill Clinical Genomics. Great. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, let's bring in our resident lawyer now, uh, Professor Gold. I mean, first of all, what you've just heard from uh, these two doctors must be music to your ears as someone who's been a long time proponent of open science. Can you tell us a bit about your work uh, around intellectual property and innovation policy and how all of this connects to the scientific advances we have just heard about? Right. Well, the neuro is a great location to be thinking about open science. We have a series of diseases that affect the brain, the nervous system, that really have not advanced as much as we as researchers and as patients have wanted. And I, I congratulate them with saying, I'm not going to do what we did before and get the same negative results. We're going to do something different. And what's different here is how do we take the resources we have, the people we have, the knowledge we have, the materials we have and make our research more effective. How do we get to that end goal differently? Because we want to ask high risk questions that frankly, a, the way we do science, uh, peer review system is not great for uh, encouraging high risk. So how do we do that? But how do we also speed up research by maybe my data is better used by someone else. I think this was one of Guy Hulot's first points is the best use of my data may be by someone in a lab in, in Brazil or in Austria. And so open science is about getting rid of those barriers. It's about spreading risk. So we're bringing in a whole lot of different actors and 
what they do is each one has their own incentives. Patients are participating because they want to cure. Philanthropies are intervening because they want to help a sector of society. Researchers are interested in their career, but mostly they're thinking about when I retire, I want to know someone was cured. Firms have mixed motivations, clearly profit. Governments want to save money, et cetera. We, we, can, we can bring these people together because we don't have to spend the time negotiating about what ifs. And the biggest what if, finally getting to your question, is intellectual property. If we start negotiating now about patent rights, it will take us six months, a year to sort it out. That's six months or a year that we haven't been doing research. So right there, there's a delay. And then you get a product and you wanna develop it. You got another six months or a year to negotiate. Right there, you've lost two years. Patients are suffering for two extra years. It also, we know that small firms just won't bother. It's too expensive, takes too much time to negotiate these big consortia where you need this multiple talent. And so half the people who could be helping us do research aren't even present. And so what open science is about and what my research is about is how do we actually use intellectual property intelligently? It has a place, it's important, but not at the beginning. At the beginning, when we're trying to understand how systems work, we're trying to come up with the first breakthrough in an area, patents aren't particularly effective. Once we've broken in, firms are really good at making the drug better, delivering it differently, and there there's a role for patents. So really open science is a complement to the existing intellectual property regime but it's based on the fact that we have different motivations and we wanna accelerate research and do research differently to ask questions that we couldn't have asked before. Mm -hmm. Great, well, that's an, thank you for that very excellent summary. Um, Dr. Karam Chandani, I just wanna turn it back to you for a second. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to get your take on what intellectual value does Professor Gold's work bring to advancing the cause of open science? And why is it so important to have this sort of view coming from beyond the scientific community? So Richard's piece is absolutely essential. What the neuro has embarked on is really an experiment. We are attempting to change the way we conduct research. And the goal is that exactly as Richard attested to, our hope is that the results are improved reproducibility, decreased waste, and hopefully even the acceleration of actual treatments because the patients who participate in consent to CBIG and the patients in Vincent's COVID biobank are doing so in a completely altruistic fashion. Their goal is to help their family members and the members of their community. And so open science, the, the hope of open science is this is very much in the interests of our patients and our patient communities. Richard's piece takes a look at the outcomes. What are the concrete things we can measure that have changed as a result of changing the, the model in which we conducted these experiments. I think it's also key that Richard is external to the building. And while I, I believe he shares our hope that the outcomes are positive, I believe he'll report his findings in a completely dispassionate way. So we're really lucky to have uh, Richard pouring in so much energy, time and thought into this project. Great, and I guess a great example of McGill bringing sort of the art and the science together to really advance uh, such an important philosophy. Uh, just another follow-up question for you, Dr. Karam Chandani. I will probably get into this a little bit more, but I mean, you've been at this at, at the Neuro now for over three years officially, and, and probably longer than that unofficially. Mm -hmm. How receptive, generally speaking, has the scientific community been, either within the Neuro or, or beyond the Neuro, beyond even McGill, to this very new concept? So that is another excellent question. And I think that we have fairly widespread adoption in excess of 80% among the principal investigators based at the MNI. And part of that is because of that extensive stakeholder consultation that I described when we started the interview. In order to really get a sense of what open science means to the people in the trenches doing experiments and thinking about sharing their data. One thing that I have personally noticed is that our new recruits are very much enthusiastic about this new model. And there may be something of a, a shift in generational attitudes about what the best way to conduct research is. 
And it's not uh, that we have to coax this new generation into following these guidelines. They have fully embraced it when they arrive and in fact help drive the grassroots changes. Great, thank you. Dr. Mosher, I, I wanna just come back to you for a, for a minute before we get more into sort of like the COVID discussion. Uh, when you came to McGill last fall, following a, a long and distinguished career that included work both at academic institutions and in the pharmaceutical industry, you were quoted at the time as saying, we are at the dawn of something really big in medicine and I wanna be a part of it. So what did you mean by that? And how is open science uh, helping to sort of frame uh, this new, this dawn of a new era in medicine? If you could just unmute again. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I joined McGill last summer, and this Canada Excellence Research Chair I've been awarded is jointly funded by federal money and by McGill. And the mission is on paper extremely simple support drug discovery and drug development using genetics and genomics. And the reason I applied, and really I put lots of energy and now I'm so excited to have this position, is that it's a complex task, but all the ingredients are there for success, I would say. Uh, and what I mean here is we have access to cutting edge genomic and information technologies here at McGill. We have superb clinicians, we have the excitement and the enthusiasm from the community there as well. But we have also the relationships with uh, other institutions internally and externally. And that is really required for success now. So what I was meaning here is really referring to these new sequencing technologies. That means the capacity that we now have to sequence the 3 billion base pairs of a single genome for less than a thousand dollars. And what we know now know from our and other initiatives is that to be successful in this space of genomic medicine and really capture the value of this effort and get return on investment, you need to think big, but you also need to have large numbers. And the reason is very simple. We're looking at some common variants in the genome, which may have a very small effect. So you need to have a lot of people to have these variants to detect the effect. Or conversely, you're looking at functional variants, which have a big effect, but are very rare. And so you need a large number of people to find them. And the genetic community has already embraced the concept of data sharing, actually since 2008. Since 2008, we are sharing data because we need these numbers. My first and original contact with McGill was in 2008 with Dr. Brent Richards. With the previous biobank we had constructed in Switzerland, we had found the first SNP or variant associated with boldness. And we needed to have a replication set. And somebody told me, wow, oh, there is a guy there at McGill who can help you. And I called this person, didn't know Brent Richards, and as a matter of weeks, he essentially could confirm these findings which we had made. And so this is, that was 13 years ago. And now people are sequencing hundreds of thousands of genomes or portion of it, and are making the data available for research. That's the new area of genomic medicine. That's the only way to succeed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mosher. And just for the record, you're the one who described that as being simple, not me. So, <laughs> um, so I'd like to, I do want to get to the sort of the COVID-19 piece and the scientific collaborations that we're seeing uh, emerge from that. But before we do, maybe I'll just ask uh, you, Professor Gold, once more, or I'll, I'll turn to you again. Um, why, in your opinion, has the field of science been so siloed historically? Um, you know, has it been a case of scientists wanting to keep their data and their findings to themselves? for profit or personal glory, perhaps wanting to see their name etched on the Nobel Prize one day, or are there bigger factors at play as well? Yeah, I don't see this as actually been driven by scientists. In fact, scientists discovered and created the open science system 300 years ago. Uh, one of the great things that Francis Bacon and those who followed him did was 
share their scientific discoveries and open it up to peer review. This is what happened in Europe and it just took off. It's one of the things that is responsible for the tremendous success of Western science. And over time, um, there was always this division between fundamental knowledge and sharing of how things work. That was always shared. And then some private, very applied research that was uh, either kept secret in the old courts, uh, in various courts around Europe, or um, by firms later on in the, in the 19th century. What has happened over the last 30 or 40 years is a, that we've forgotten that we need both components, that we need complete openness, complete transparency in some areas in order to drive the commercialization, the, 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 the application of that knowledge. And so we start patenting things like human genes, fundamental knowledge, and that clogged up the system. We had less room for sharing. We put more emphasis on patents. We asked universities to get patents. In fact, some of the research chairs that we have, one of the deals between the federal government at the time, this is you know, 20 years ago, and the universities was, we'll give you these federal chairs if you can patent and commercialize more. So over the last 40 years, we've been changing the boundary between open and closed so that closed is taking over. And what we're seeing now is it has driven up costs and it has driven down productivity. And we need to go back to the system that made Western science the preeminent scientific model in the world. And that's really what open science is about. All right, uh, Dr. Karam Chandani, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I'd like to weigh in a little bit because I don't believe anyone at the neuro, myself included, mean to impugn people who employ the traditional scientific model, or as you described it, proprietary science. Right now, it takes, it, it, and will, it takes money to do good research. And right now, funding is very much tied to a history of successful publishing in high impact journals, most of whom employ paywalls. So you're, the a meaningful discovery then goes behind the paywall, so it is not open. But if the impact factor is high enough, that justifies subsequent research in the field. So right now, I think the incentives are placed in a way that encourages the traditional model. Okay. Yeah, can I just... Yeah, yeah go ahead. I see yeah, you. just to follow up on Jason's point, hopefully we'll get off this question eventually. Um, the actual... There are people who study publications and their impact. And what's surprising is that the impact of high impact journals is less than those of low impact journals. And that's because the way we measure impact is the number of citations in two years. But if you're gonna have a breakthrough impact, it takes five or nine years before it gets picked up. And so the high impact journals are ones where everybody already can see that it's novel, which means it's not novel because <laughs> it's not challenging enough. So we've set up a series of, uh, of measures of our success that drive us to not be successful. Interesting the way you put that. So let me uh, get to the current situation and, and I'd love to get your, your opinions on, on what has changed in the last eight weeks. So we've obviously seen some incredible scientific collaborations taking, taking place around the world, across boundaries, across borders, between you know, universities and, and private firms, all in the sort of service of finding either a vaccine or antivirals or treatments uh, for the COVID-19 uh, virus. So, so why? Are, so, I get maybe I'll start at the beginning. Are you? Are any of you surprised uh, to see this shift happen so quickly? I think that uh, we're seeing this shift in both the scientific community as well as outside of the scientific community. I was surprised at the speed with which the genome of COVID one nine was disseminated in the scientific community, but I was perhaps even more shocked to see mainstream media move their COVID-related articles from behind paywalls into the public domain. Hmm. And, and Dr. Moser, I know uh, earlier uh, ahead of this call, we spoke specifically about the media, and I know you had some specific uh, points on that. So are, are you surprised to see even the, the, the mainstream media um, make all this information 
uh, public and free? And is that a good thing? Or are there some concerns that we need to be thinking about as well? I think it's it's very good news that the media is disseminating knowledge on the virus because there are so many unknowns and we are all concerned. It's a matter of every single individual. It's not some people who are affected, it's all of us. So and the challenges are so big and there are so many unanswered questions that I'm really happy that the media is helping us and disseminating some important information. There are probably one concern is the speed and quality. It is really important that high quality data be or information be released. Otherwise that generate fake news. And we have seen that with chloroquine, for instance, we have seen lots of bizarre news which have made the highlights of the media. And eventually upon detailed uh, scientific uh, studies, have shown potentially to be wrong. So we need absolutely to manage expectations. Unfortunately, we need to give time to time. That means we need to do the experiments properly and derive information which is scientifically solid, robust, and honestly peer reviewed as well, probably. And that takes time, it's a bit unfortunate. So I think there is a risk here of quality of fake news and that, in my opinion, pushes researchers to be even more solid, more robust, and more uh, strict as well on what we want to publish. I know, Jason, you want to comment on that, probably. Well, I think one of the, the aims of open science is not only the sharing of a conclusion, but also the results that were interrogated to generate that conclusion. So one of the best ways to dispel uh, erroneous information is to allow people to reanalyze the, the original data set. And so the open sharing of data, I think, will accelerate uh, the clearing up the misapprehensions in this area as well. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I guess if somebody's going to, even in a failed experiment, is going to make errors along the way, better to share those with others so that others don't waste their time making those same mistakes. Now, during this pandemic, oh, go ahead, Dr. Mosher. <laughs> Can I agree more with Jason? One important thing though, high quality data. I think right. it's of paramount importance. People can generate some very bizarre conclusions if the quality of the data is not good enough. And that has been a driver actually for us as well in collecting high quality samples as well. Because when we're collecting samples, there are lots of issues which we call pre-analytical, for instance. That means before we analyze the samples, related to the way the samples were collected, were handled, were stored, were retrieved. These are all important things and that's why quality is important. We need to manage here quality and speed. And that comes to another issue, which is costings. These are not cheap things to do, but we need to spend the money. And I'm really glad actually that the federal government here has made decisions on investing massively on uh, COVID-related research. Mm -hmm. Now, on the flip side of the sort of collaboration piece, I know that during this pandemic, we've seen a lot of government leaders obviously shutting their borders in a, in a bid to contain the infection. Uh, but we've also heard people casting the coronavirus research as a sort of national imperative. Um, and I'm wondering, um, maybe I'll turn to you, Professor Gold, to start, you know, has this political approach uh, of, of people thinking and casting it as sort of a national imperative, a race to, to which country will get the vaccine first, has this at all handcuffed any international collaborations among scientists? Yeah, I mean, first, it's important to note this is a minority view in a minority of countries. Now, one of those countries happens to be quite powerful, but the scientific community, I think, rejects it. Uh, and most governments recognize that you're not going to beat COVID either on the ground or scientifically unless we work together, right? I mean, it's like closing your borders, fixing COVID in Canada, but letting it go around the world, not a terribly useful solution. Same way, Canada doesn't have the expertise to do everything. We don't necessarily have the biomanufacturing or we have some areas that we're strong and other areas we're not. The same goes for other countries. So we have to work together. Uh, even the United States recognizes that, and despite what 
Olympic leaders are saying, they're not following those directives. They, they understand. There was an article in the New York Times just a few weeks ago just saying how American researchers are, are sharing just like everybody else. But it does point to the importance of being part of the team. What you don't want to be is a country that sits back, lets the research happen elsewhere, and doesn't do it at home. Because if we're at the table, if we're contributing, then when we get an antiviral or we get a vaccine, we understand it, we can translate it at home, but we also have the partnerships to make it happen here. So investing in research and investing in open research is critical to our later ability to actually access the drugs. If we took a proprietary approach and did everything ourselves, the chances of success would be incredibly low because you're in a silo and someone else develops it. Now you have no leverage. You're not part of the team. So openness is critical not only for getting the research done, but ensuring that Canadians are among those who benefit equally from the, the vaccine and, um, and antivirals. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, sort of the development of drugs and vaccines. So maybe we'll just stay on that point for a minute. Um, you know, when it comes to you know, drug development, developing, you know, uh, antivirals, biomarkers, it feels like this could be a very long and expensive enterprise. How long does it generally take to bring a new drug to market and, and how much of a financial investment is involved in that? Who do you want to answer uh, that? I mean, I'll turn to Dr. Mosher because I know you've, uh, you lived that experience at the, in the pharmaceutical world. Yes, I've been actually very privileged. I've spent 10 years in pharma R&D, in a big pharma R&D, and I call that my 10 year sabbatical because that was full of learnings there. Uh, you're absolutely right, Derek. We estimate right now that it takes, say, 10 years to get a drug to the market. It takes probably a couple of billion dollars and the failure rate is extremely high. That means the probability that one molecule goes to the market is extremely small. And uh, we need to be creative right away. I think we need to use these new technologies. We use, need to use open access. And actually, I think that refers as well to what Richard was saying before, the pre-competitive landscape. We need to fill up this landscape. And industry is very willing to do open science in the competitive landscape. Uh, I think we need to use all these new technologies, uh, IT, information technology, genomics, to increase the probability of success and reduce the risk of attrition or to make attrition of drugs faster. I think we can use as well information analysis, AI, sorry, intelligent, artificial intelligence, machine learning to try to help us now decipher the very big data sets and trying to find the optimal molecules which have the highest chance of success. There is one thing which has been widely advertised recently is what we would call drug repositioning. That means take existing drugs like chloroquine and see if it works for COVID related infection. The advantage here is these molecules may have been already through all the testing. They may even have reached the market and demonstrated saf safety. And so repositioning these molecules could be a very sort of quick win for industry, doctors, patients. Uh, it's not that easy though. And anytime we are thinking about re drug repositioning, of course, we need to really think about proper randomized clinical trials to demonstrate their value. That takes time. That takes patience, that takes funding, and that takes also partnership with industry. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Karim Chandani, go ahead. Well, one of the common misperceptions around open science, one of the principles of open science is that we don't do intellectual property here at the Montreal Neurological Institute. And sometimes people interpret that as somehow an anti-industry sentiment, which is not at all the case. Vaisan is describing uh, a path to, to creating a meaningful drug that cost billions with an S of dollars. And unfortunately, most of the drugs that enter into these trials never see the light of day. They don't show the intended effect. And there's perhaps no other disease system that understands this more than neurological diseases. 
because we have wasted tens of billions of dollars trying to bring drugs to market that would have an impact on Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and other movement disorders. And unfortunately, most of the time, these don't result in anything that's, that's meaningful. So the goal of the basic research that happens in this building is to help inform the drug companies to better select the candidates in which to invest these billions of dollars to produce something that's meaningful for patients. So let me just stick with you uh, for a minute, if, if I may. Um, I mean, we've obviously, I mean, talked about the expense of, of drug development. It sounds like in many ways, you know, for lack of a better word, it's a bit of a crap uh, crapshoot. You're sort of investing a lot of money, hoping that it's going to, to yield something. Uh, companies, pharmaceutical companies, drug developers are obviously going to look at the bottom line as well and want to make sure that if this thing does develop, it's going to be a, a drug that will have a long shelf life. And, you know, I'm thinking of things like, you know, Viagra or Lipitor. So what would sort of be the motivation or the incentive for a company to embark uh, on a long, expensive path to develop, uh, say, a vaccine for Ebola that might be used by a small percentage of the population just once um, instead of just focusing on more Viagras? Richard? Uh, <laughs> sure, because I studied this. Um, we actually looked at the Ebola virus. Guess where it was invented? At a lab, a, a federal government laboratory in Winnipeg. Uh, it was commercial law, it was patented and hoped that a company, a small company with no track record, because they were the only takers, would take it. They paid a pittance. And then the Ebola outbreak in 2014 hit. And guess who paid for the drugs to be manufactured? Canada. Okay, well, then you would think, would the firm go ahead and commercialize it, do the clinical trials? No, WHO did it. In fact, everything was paid for by the public. And that's because there are big holes in the discovery system. Firms are not structured. This is not a knock against them, but they have no incentive to go after rare diseases. And there are a whole bunch of those. Um, there are a whole bunch of diseases that affect predominantly poor countries like Ebola. Um, even a vaccine for COVID uh, it's probably not, it may not be. I mean, if it's around forever, yes, there'll be some money, but without the public funding, it would not happen. So we really need to think about the fact that we can't just rely on the private sector to solve our problems. They're not going to. And it's, it takes uh, a lot of public funding. In fact, most drugs, uh, at least for uh, breakthrough drugs, had their origin from public funding. And so this is not an either or situation. We need to understand what motivates the private sector, what motivates the different sectors and bring them together. Open science, as I said before, provides a mechanism to enable that to happen. Because we can't ask the pharmaceutical companies to pour billions of dollars in without the prospect of getting money. They just won't do it. Nor mm -hmm. should they do it if, uh, you know, putting my hat on as a corporate lawyer, they would be going against the interests of their shareholders, which is their primary duty. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, Professor Gold, uh, you're actually involved in a couple of projects, both here in Canada and in the United States, around the development of antivirals. Um, can yeah. you talk, tell us a little bit about that and, and how critical this work is, um, either to the current pandemic or as we even start to think about and prepare for the next pandemic? Sure. So, I mean, this came out of our sister institution. There are lots of links with it, the Structural Genomics Consortium. They fund uh, lots of work at McGill. Uh, they also are uh, have played a, a pivotal role when uh, the neuro was setting up and trying to think about how to be open science because the SGC is the world's first truly open partnership. And by the way, it was formed by pharmaceutical companies. So this is not, again, a knock on industry. They were behind it. Um, and they fund a bunch of research. One part of it was a year ago, they saw the need to develop antivirals in case we hit a pandemic. So this was well before COVID hit. And researchers at UNC are experts at target identification. And so they started this work. And then COVID hit. And then we realized, well, it's not enough <laughs> just to identify the target. You have to identify a drug. Well, one of the best academic uh, chemists for drug happens to be at the SGC. And so they're doing that part. And then we have virologists across Canada to help us. 
So what we did is we set up a nonprofit in Canada, uh, was incorporated 10 days ago called Vimy, um, after Vimy Ridge, but it's a viral interruption medicines initiative, so Vimy with an I. And in the United States, we set up a global entity, again, nonprofit, called Rapidly Emerging Antiviral Drug Discovery Initiative, or Ready. And the purpose of these initiatives is to do, uh, develop antivirals completely in the open up to phase one, so that we show that they're not gonna kill anybody when you put them in their body. And when the pandemic hits, you can then move quickly to trial those drugs uh, against that disease. So we're doing a few projects in COVID, uh, but we know it will take time to get to a result. So everybody is hoping for a fast vaccine, although usually vaccines take a dozen years to develop. We're hoping to get it in six months or a year. Uh, we're hoping for the repurposing that Vincent talked about, but our track record historically has not been very good. And so this is the third arm of our strategy, which is let's do drug discovery in the open to get the acceleration and enable all countries to, to benefit. And by being open, it means all the data, all the materials, no patents. And so no country can say to another country, you don't have access to this because it's in the public domain. Uh, so we have set this up. Uh, we've made a request to the Canadian government for funding for the Canadian arm of this. Um, the American version, the Ready, uh, is going to be doing fundraising soon in the United States. So it's a very exciting time. It's a time that lawyers uh, can contribute to actually pandemic. I, the, you know, some of my students at uh, Morrison Forrester in the United States were my first contact. They're doing this pro bono. Uh, students at Tories, my old law firm doing this pro bono. So here we see the scientific community doing everything they can to advance science and knowledge. But I also see that my colleagues in the legal community are doing what they can with their skills to set up these nonprofits completely free. Mm -hmm. And I guess if there is one thing that's happened with, with COVID, I think it's sort of probably created a, an environment, there's never been an environment like this where so much of the world's attention now is focused on science, on research, on, on drug development, correct? Yes, I, mean, I think all three of us have felt it. You can see it in the funding calls. Uh, you could see it uh, evidently on Twitter. You could see it, you know, this discussion that you have set up. Uh, but we don't want to forget that there are a whole bunch of other bad diseases out there, right? Malaria kills more people. Uh, climate change in the long term is going to affect most of us. So what we have to remember is that what we're doing here shows us that we can mobilize and we can actually go after these other diseases. So if we came out of this, I know that it will probably end on this, but later on, you know, what's the next step? You know, will we go backwards and go back to our old systems or will we learn about how exciting this is? I mean, I don't want, want to get the disease, but the excitement of being able to partner across fields, across countries, will we remember this in the future? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so hold hold that thought because I will uh, come circle yeah. back to sort of you know, is this really a turning point for uh, for the scientific community and for the world? Um, we did get a couple of questions from alumni that came in in the last couple of days. So maybe now's a good time to, to turn to them. We have a few minutes left. I'll you, since we're on the subject of vaccines, I'll start with this one from uh, Francois Gauthier. Uh, he had a few short questions around the distribution of uh, the vaccine when one will be ready. Uh, so I'll just read quickly. He, he was wondering what will drive the rate of distribution for an eventual vaccine? Will geopolitical considerations limit its worldwide distribution? And will the vaccine be delivered first to those who are most vulnerable, such as the elderly, or based on one's role in society? For instance, frontline healthcare workers or politicians? Anyone wanna jump in on that one? I think just to start, cause I'm the lawyer, so I'll say anything about any topic um, and I'll let the, the, the scientists jump in. There's what we would like and what's going to happen and how can we make it more likely that what we want will happen. Um, so certainly frontline workers, especially those in hospitals ought to get this first. First of all, there's gonna be a higher risk. Whoever gets the first vaccines are going to face a higher risk. The vaccine may not work, it may have side effects. So when you're trying to choose a population, you should be choosing a population where the benefit of the vaccine outweighs that risk. And that's generally frontline workers who are more likely to get the disease and therefore would benefit more from it. So 
scientifically it makes sense to do that, but also, but more importantly, socially. Um, politicians don't really need it. They can work perfectly fine on Zoom. Many university professors are the same. Um, my biggest concern is between developed and developing countries though. Um, if we only solve the problem in rich countries, we haven't solved the problem because it will mutate, it will come back in a different form. And from, you know, who knows what the immunity uh, to COVID is, um, but there's a huge chance that it will mutate uh, over a longer term. So how do we ensure that developing countries have the resources to do it? Uh, and there are some restrictions within international trade agreements that could get in the way. Um, there are forces that are trying to say, let's solve this problem now by making sure that intellectual property and other trade rules don't get in the way, but that's a serious concern. There's also the manufacturing ability, who's gonna manufacture it, um, what kind of drug, an antiviral, a simple drug is easier and cheaper to produce, a biologic, very expensive, we're not gonna all get it, it'll take longer. So it depends on what we produce and it depends on some of the policies we develop now. Mm -hmm. Great, any of our scientists wanna jump in on that? Dr. Karen Chandandi? So unfortunately I don't have a large say in public policy, but I can wear my healthcare provider hat and echo a little bit about what Richard said. I think the question elegu elegantly uh, encompassed some of the factors that we, I would hope informs public policy. And we have others, other instances in medicine where you have to decide how to distribute limited resources, organ transplantation being a rather meaningful example. And there it's multifactorial. It's about the patient, different risk factors. And so you, the goal is to try to get those organs to the people who need them most and who will benefit the most from that aggressive intervention. And so I hope a similar evidence-based model is applied to the COVID vaccine as well when it's developed. Okay, Dr. Moser, please go ahead. No, I don't want to expand on what has been said so eloquently by my colleagues. Just emphasize again, the, there are, it's very difficult to do shortcuts here. We need to do the proper clinical trial showing the value and as Richard was saying, the risk benefit ratio for, for these vaccines. We, we need also to keep in mind all these frustrations. That means we have been waiting now for a vaccine for HIV for 30 years. It's not been here yet, despite investments, despite lots of attempts and trials. So we need to stay very modest and ask for a real solid scientific demonstration of the benefits, if any, of such vaccines versus risk. That's expensive, takes time again, Takes, com takes commitment from funding organizations, doctors, communities, patients. And uh, again, if we had a magic bullet, it would be wonderful. There is no such uh, in this space, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you all for, for your insight on that. Um, we do have one more question uh, that came in from one of our viewers. This was from Diane Wolfenden. Uh, it's more general in nature, uh, but she was asking, so she writes that, Canada is good at scientific advancements, but very weak on commercializing those advancements. Will the changes in how science is done ameliorate or exacerbate this problem? Dr. Uh, Professor Gold, go ahead. Um, well, it depends. It depends on how what we do about it. One of the goals of open science is to do science and innovation differently. While the emphasis at the neuro will be at the earlier stages, not all of it is, they go into clinical research. And the goal of open science by bringing in these commercial partners is to give them an inside look, to give them what we call tacit knowledge about how things work and so on. So they can more quickly develop products and services. So we're part of the goal of open science is to create an ecosystem around star institutions like the neuro bring in firms, an AI firm that might not have worked with the neuro or would have worked it in a narrow capacity, suddenly will say, look, if you put out your data in a certain format with a certain amount of metadata, I'm interested. And maybe their product will be a financial tool in the end, but they want to play with our data set. I don't know. But what we're trying to do is say, what we've done in the past 
hasn't achieved the innovation goals we have. We, you can't think of that many Canadian companies that have not only been global leaders, but have stayed that way, right? BlackBerry didn't, Nortel didn't, maybe Shopify will defy the odds. Um, in the biotech space, you know, Biochem Pharma, but that went away too, is now controlled the United States. So trying to do the same old thing again uh, is uh, Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Open science allows us the opportunity to experiment. What we don't know, what no one could predict is, will it actually generate a change? We hope so, we have reason to believe, but that's part of why we need to assess it and ask ourselves the question, do we need to change the way we're doing things uh, outside of open science? So it's not a solution to the entire system, but we think it is an important experiment with lots of thinking behind it that will help uh, help Canada achieve its innovation goals, which is to have firms here that become global leaders uh, that bring revenue back to Canada, that employ a lot of people here, and that get us into these international networks. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Karim Chandani, go ahead. So I agree entirely with Richard. The goal of open science is not anti-intellectual property. It's not, the question is when do you erect these barriers? And the idea is most of the science that we do here at the Montreal Neurological Institute is fundamental. It helps inform our understanding of the pathologies to allow for meaningful and evidence-based drug discovery. Where you put up the IP is when you're talking about a concrete molecule that does something. It's that, that last 500 yards uh, of the race of drug discovery. So the, the goal is to decrease barriers when you're doing the investigations that, that lead to meaningful discoveries. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Moser. <laughs> oh, sorry, Richard. Uh, I want to come back to one point uh, as well. Canada is not the only country to invest into COVID research. We know that lots of countries are doing that. Uh, open science is, of course, absolutely wonderful and needed, but it sets the bar higher. It's more competitive now. And I think for me, what is really important, and again, that's why I'm so happy actually to have seen these big investments from federal and provincial money, is to be competitive, we need to play with the big boys. We need to be there. We need to be really good in science. And that is a full dedication investment. And research is an investment here. You don't invest now. Others will be the, the players in the future, very near future. Right. Thank you. So oh, sorry. go ahead, uh, Professor. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to go back. There are some places just, you know, while uh, clearly the, the fundamental research is an area where we should be doing more open science, there are some areas where we can de-risk commercial research by actually developing some breakthrough drugs. So our sister institution, the Structural Genomics Consortium, has set up uh, an organization uh, called Medicines for Kids, M4K Pharma. And they're developing a rare a drug for a rare brain disease in children. And they're not using patent rights. They're using a different form of protection called uh, data protection. But everything they produce, including their strategic meetings, are in the open. Their lab books are open. So we also want to play with, in the commercial space, at least for breakthroughs or rare diseases, um, we want to play uh, in open as well. So it shouldn't be confined to early stages and it will be predominantly for-profit proprietary research in the you know, application stage, but there's a room for interchange in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, we only have a few minutes left and I did want to end with a question for each of you. So maybe I'll pose the question and ask if you could maybe get your answers down to you know, 60 seconds or so, but this is really looking back at, or sort of projecting forward. So if we were to project you know, five or even 10 years ahead from now and, and the COVID-19 pandemic is in fact behind us, I'm curious to get each of your takes in terms of you know, what does open science or collaborative science look like uh, down the road? Is the COVID-19 pandemic, do you see it as really being this turning point uh, from which there's no way to go back that the world will now understand the importance of collaboration 
or is this a one-time moment and we are likely to revert back to some of the older ways? Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Karmchen. Danny, if that's all right. Absolutely, I think it's a great question. And although we can't predict the future, Vincent alluded to something which is very interesting, which is in the world of genomics, the concept of data sharing is not new. It's more than 10 years old. And we have the Cancer Genome Atlas, now known as the Genomic Commons, where scientists understand that by pooling data, by sharing data, they're more likely to end up with leverageable discoveries. So my hope is this is a train that has already left the station. The neuro is conducting an experiment and Richard is going to evaluate that experiment. And hopefully the results of this will accelerate the uptake. But my personal belief is that this is the direction we're heading towards. Uh, and I believe that the generational differences in attitudes towards how, we, how open we are will also uh, participate in this culture change. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Mosher, how about uh, yourself? Are you optimistic as well? I am. I am. I think COVID is absolutely accelerating the pace here. And again, I'm so glad that people like uh, Jason, Dr. Hulo, Richard has done this background work so that we can now capitalize on it and, and uh, run fast. It will be also an opportunity to demonstrate the value of this approach. And we need to do that because it's very tempting to go back to old ways of doing research. Now, if we can demonstrate the value of open science, this type of collaborations, it's been demonstrated in genetics. If you can demonstrate that in other pharma vaccine related uh, fields, it would be wonderful and no return to bad habits. Okay, great, thank you. And I guess um, we'll give the last word uh, to our, our, our lawyer on the panel, closing arguments, perhaps. Uh, Professor Gold, your thoughts on this? Well, I'm a pessimist because I'm a lawyer. Um, so I don't know. And what I do know is whatever predictions we make, someone's going to play them back to us in five years and they'll be wrong in some major way. So I think there are a few different futures available. One is we do learn our lesson and we, we follow through, but we can follow through in different ways. We can follow through by just saying the words or we can follow through by governments specifically funding open science, by universities changing the way they evaluate us so that we don't have to be in high impact journals that we can be in other ones. So yeah, you can say open science, we all believe in it, but if you don't put in the structures that actually make open science happen, it ain't gonna come. And then the other possibility is, you know, we go back and we just say, okay, well, that was for a pandemic. Let's go back to our individual silos. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to do that. Most of the people of my generation are used to that. Um, so this is an opportunity for the young researchers who I think have bought into, for a bunch of reasons, openness and sharing to take over. Will they shove us aside and just say, I don't care about you guys we're going open. And so to the extent I have faith, it's in them. Um, but I would like to see governments step up. I've seen nice comments from uh, the chief scientists of Canada, uh, Minister Baines, he was congratulating a, a Canadian research team for having sequenced um, the virus and sharing it globally and talking about open science. Great words, I'm waiting for tangible action not just now, but in five years. Then I'll be able to answer your question. Okay, sounds good. We'll have you back in a few years. But I did sense a bit of optimism in there as well. So, um, well, that about wraps up the time we have for today. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live or watch it again if you'd like. Uh, and please keep watching your email and social media feeds for more information about how McGill is confronting the challenges of COVID-19 and keeping you informed with insight from our academic and medical experts. If you are a McGill graduate who is currently not receiving our emails but would like to be added to our distribution list, you can visit alumni.mcgill.ca slash register to sign up. And this link will also be available beneath the video player on our YouTube channel. There is still time to support the two new funds that McGill has established in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. One supports students in need of emergency relief, and the other is directed to advancing some of the groundbreaking research taking place at McGill 
and the MUHC under the MI4 banner. You can find out more information about these funds and make a gift today at giving.mcgill.ca. That's giving.mcgill.ca. You may have also received a survey from McGill asking for your feedback about these webcasts. If you have time, I would encourage you to take a few minutes to answer the short survey as your feedback is valuable in helping us inform how we put this series together. And finally, I'd like to extend a tremendous thank you to our three guests, uh, Drs. Vincent Mosier and Jason Karamchandani and Professor Richard Gold for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today and for providing us with their insights and perspectives on the way in which we conduct science now and in the future. And thank you McGill alumni for tuning in as well. Please be sure to join us again next Thursday as we take a break from the science and medicine of the pandemic to focus on music. Three professors from McGill Schulich School of Music will join us as we examine why music is such a source of comfort and well-being during times of stress and anxiety and look at how musicians and the arts are managing during this pandemic. On behalf of all of us at McGill's Office of University Advancement, please stay safe, be well, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.